people sent in questions. I'd like to ask you some questions. The first one is, when do you start writing the score? Like when you read the script? or later on in the process? Is there a process? It, it really depends on, on the situation. Uh, if there's music that's being uh, either performed or played or, or, or sung in the film, uh, there, there'll be pre-production done. And uh, for example, if it's a singer singing on film, the song will typically be recorded uh, and then uh, play back on the set and usually lip sync to, uh, to the playback music. Uh, that's in that event. You know, there's some instances where music will be recorded beforehand. Usually what the process is, is around somewhere around the rough cut of a film, it ends up in the hands of the composer and then uh, you start the process at that point that point where are you gonna go where are you gonna run where are you gonna hide nowhere because there's no one like you left that's right oh god that's right that's good you're listening now that's very good okay now i know you're frightened steve i know you're scared that's okay I understand that. You're confused. But let me tell you something, Steve. Let me tell you something. All that anger, all that fear, all that confusion, it's gonna melt away. It's gonna go away, Steve. It's gonna go away. You go to sleep. You wake up. It's very simple. In the morning, you wake up. You feel wonderful. We will be together. We're connected. We're close. We're together. More pure. That's good. Dad! Oh, Dad! Let's go to bed, Steve. Let's go to bed. Get away from me! Get away from my kid! films uh, in the mid 80s and because I'm a piano player and a keyboard player and had some background in uh, orchestration and arranging but I had keyboards and this was at the time where we started to first hear uh, you know synthesized scores Wendy Wendy Carlos Walter Carlos uh, Tomita was a Japanese uh, artist who was doing classical things on synthesizers, Jan Hammer a little later with Miami Vice. And I was a little bit on, you know, uh, in early on that, you know, on the kind of ground floor of that because I was a piano player. I was not a, a synth programmer type, not, just not my bag, but I had the axes, you know, I had the Mini Moog and and Fender Rhodes and, and an acoustic piano and a, uh, an ARP Odyssey. These were the first instruments that we used with, uh, with Abel. So I, I got in on what later the agents started calling uh, principally electronic scores, which were synthesized and then some. This was before every, everybody had a, a, an iPhone that they could do it on. Um, way, way before it. So you really needed a setup. You needed a recording setup and a keyboard setup. So throughout my career, many of the scores were principally uh, electronic. But there were ways, you know, you're talking about a process. There were ways of making those uh, electronic scores sound better and it was by using the electronic sounds that sounded good and in a way were undetectable from natural and acoustic instruments 
and adding, say, a string section or a real horn section, adding vocalists, you know, of course, guitars and stuff like that were normal. The things that synthesized well were, you know, drums and, and, and bass and keyboards, piano sounds were easy to do. So it became a combination of those things. Then, of course, with certain scores, we went more full orchestral, but I was never being brought in on scores as uh, doing large orchestrations and sound stages and symphonic scores. There were other people who, who had that market cornered. So, there were some orchestral ones for sure, but they, were, they tended to be principally electronic. When it's primarily a score, do you start when you first see the script or do you sit down with the director? What's the usual MO? It, it depends on the director. Some, uh, some directors will, uh, will bring you in very early in the, uh, the filming process. Uh, 
with Abel Ferrara, who I've worked with so much, you know, we're talking and uh, planning things well in advance. So I, I'm, I'm usually involved from, uh, from before there's a script sometimes, and then the first draft of the script I'm looking at. And we're talking about everything from uh, casting to, you know, a, a scenic design and every other thing. So I'm really well involved in that process usually from very early on. And then music with Abel's films can be organic and going from, you know, uh, from that point. You know, we could conceivably start writing themes that might give them some uh, inspiration or uh, direction in how they they shoot it. Hershiser leans in for the sign. He's to the belt. His pitch to Benia. Ball outside. Laurel Hershiser does not have his good stuff. He has struggled the entire four innings. White Gooden leads off third. Vince Coleman on first, dancing back and forth, trying to distract Hershiser. He's having enough trouble concentrating on his pitches at this point. He's to the stretch. Here's the 1-0 pitch to Benia, and Benia rips it down the third baseline. It's rolling toward the corner. Gooden scores easily. Now the ball's bouncing around in the corner, and Coleman is tearing around third. He'll score. Benia around second, holds up, goes back into second with a double. The Mets lead five to nothing. Five to nothing, and you gotta wonder if the Dodgers can ever recover from this deficit. That should be it for Hershiser. In fact, Tommy Lasorda is coming out of the dugout right now. Before he even reaches the mound, he is motioned to the bullpen, and in, in relief, comes Ramon Martinez. Lasorda using every arm he has available to try and win this series. Meanwhile, the game competitor... That's with Abel, it's not always the same process. Very often you're, you're brought in as the film is ready to be scored, which is at the end of the, you know, the, the production and post-production food chain that they bring in a composer. And then, you know, the standard process is the composer goes, sits around a table with a producer and a director or whatever, and, and people and you screen the film, you take notes, it's called a spotting session and you decide what is going where and what the style and uh, the feeling of the music is going to be and uh, and how long it will be and where it's uh, where it's taking the film um, emo generally emotionally and pace wise and everything else. So the spotting session is, you know, kind of a standard approach to doing it. With Abel, we sometimes spot things, but it's often very, you know, there'll be, say, screenings after the film is somewhat scored and, and close to complete, and we might have a screening that serves as a spotting session where we're looking at everything in context and saying, yeah, this is working, this is uh, not working. So it's, I think it's different from director to director. Some directors uh, will bring you in early in on the, on the process, others not until a final locked cut of the film. Hey, you know, do you think we ought to leave a trail of breadcrumbs? Uh, that'll be fine, Max. <sighs>
I feel so at home in nature. <sighs> Never again. With Abel, it's always fluid. So it's ongoing from, uh, as I said, from possibly from the first draft of the script to the, uh, you, the, the final touches of the mix and the delivery of the film. It's always ongoing. And when something is great and is working, it is very much in a way seen by seen. Rarely is a film scored from from beginning to end, especially uh, especially really all of them, you know, but Siberia was we painstakingly uh, scored and did sound design on every frame of the film and it was just this ongoing process and it was it was really uh, Wonderful. In some instances, again, you just deliver the whole thing from, you know, time coded from the first frame to the end of the film. And, uh, and that's the way it is delivered, you know, in one piece. Depends on what you're working on. If it's a, if it's a, a longer range project where you're working on something for months at a time, there are going to be adjustments and revisions and remixes and things that go on. Uh, during the process, if it's a, a an episodic television show uh, where you're on delivery and Monday morning that thing arrives, it arrives top to bottom, and hopefully there are no changes, and maybe there are a couple of little changes, and you revise that and uh, put it in. I think it goes project to project, uh, genre to genre in terms of you know whether it's a feature film, a documentary, or, or uh, an episodic TV show or otherwise. So there are a lot of different possibilities out there. Sooner or later, a thug will tell his tale. We all want to go on record. So let's hear for all the hoods. The Jews out of Brownsville. The blacks on Lenox Avenue. The Italians from Mulberry Street. The Irish in Hell's Kitchen. Like that. Meanwhile, Puerto Ricans been getting jammed since the 40s and ain't nobody said nothing. Well, I'm gonna lay it on you one time, for the record. My people, they hit New York and fired into the Roach Stables in Spanish Harlem and the South Bronx. They sat behind the sewing machines, stood behind the steam tables, and marched behind the brooms. In other words, they busted the ass. How'd I survive growing up? Hustling, thieving, break-ins. Anything for dollars and them days. This here's the story of East Harlem. Blacks on one side, Italians on the other, and Puerto Ricans stuck right there in the middle. And any way you cross the line <laughs> could get your ass killed. In uh, the funeral, which was uh, a period uh, piece set in sort of Yonkers in the 30s, and it was it's really a, it's a story of uh, three brothers who were kind of low level uh, hoods, gangster guys. Chris Walken, it's a wonderful film with Walken and uh, um, and Annabella and um, Gretchen Mall, Chris Penn was in it, right? We talked about this earlier. And one of the songs we did was, we did some period songs. One was called uh, Chicken Peck. I'm not gonna sing it, but I'll play it.
do you take direction or do you give direction to the film? Depends. Uh, you're always taking direction. You know, film is a collaborative process, of course. Um, so you're working with other people and you're taking direction, uh, first of all, from the director himself. Uh, editors are very, very involved. And uh, as far as music goes, a very important part of the selection process and the in a way the decision-making process of uh, film with music. It's, uh, editors are, uh, because you're working with the film and in the editing process they tend to uh, do what's called a temp dub. So they'll be editing away and they'll pull something off the shelf and they'll just throw something in that seems to work. And sometimes it works really well and it's very hard to uh, to get it as well as the the temp dub, but editors are uh, play a big part in in all of that. And of course, yeah, you're taking direction from directors. There are some directors who rely more on your intuition and your uh, your choices, if you, if you will. And then there are more hands-on people who are really kind of pushing you and. Uh, into a, a certain area. It, it works great both ways. It's really, it can be really wonderful when somebody says, yeah, I really want something that's like this, that's in this style, and, it, and you're pointed in, you know, a good direction uh, right off. When we did, uh, there was a film called, I think it was Becoming Human for, uh, um, for Nova. And it was a three. It was an epic film. It's really wonderful if you can uh, get it streaming on, online. It was three hours long, and it was wall to wall, wall to wall music. And I remember that the producer and with television, in a lot of ways, it's more a, a producer's game. You know, they tend to be the ones, uh, an executive producer, a producer's game, because they tend to be writing the scripts and writing the, the stories. And he pointed me in the direction, he said we wanted to uh, use a cor anglie, which is uh, an English horn as the principal instrument. And that was a great bit of direction because right off the bat, I knew that they wanted it. They wanted some of these cues or the overall feeling of the, uh, of the film itself to be orchestrated and orchestral uh, in nature. Uh, so. Um, it was just a great reference and it pointed the whole show in a uh, sonically in a, a direction that I think was really good and it was a wonderful project I mean from beginning to end it took a long time to do it it was six months in the uh, in the works and you know a piece that I'm very proud of of years ago, on the plains of Africa, a momentous event took place. Apes that had walked on four legs stood up and walked on two. Eventually, this change in posture would be followed by a change in their brains. Somehow, over time, they would become us. We know it happened, but we've never known when or why until now. Thinking about the most recent films, okay. um, one of which being Tommaso. Right, uh, the two most recent films were uh, called Tommaso and Siberia. Tommaso was, uh, was shot in Rome and is somewhat uh, autobiographical uh, relative to the director, Abel Ferrara. Uh, and it stars Willem Dafoe. And uh, the way the music came down, we decided to try, we wanted to do things that were 
unorthodox, not conventional in the scoring. So we didn't really want uh, traditional score per se, and I, I suggested that maybe we tried the old John Cage prepared piano. I don't know if you can, uh, if you can, if I can really set it up, but we took like any manner of, uh, I just have a few things here. These are some of the kinds of things that we use for chains and whisks and, and chains, chains, whisks, more metallic things like you could get. <laughs> this may not sound so good, but and there was all kinds of business that was used. <laughs> changes the sound of the piano, doesn't it? This is uh, a Nancy Apple song that I just played regular piano on for her, her new record. Let me see if I can get this down so I can reach in there. Sometimes you take, I'm going to say in the lower register, a beater. As you can see, I took... So that's what Tommaso sounded like. This is kind uh, of what Tommaso sounded like. microphone on it which we didn't have there and recorded and that became more or less the sort of what I played there was something of the uh, of the sound of the, the film right I left when uh, I basically left I wasn't there because I wasn't sober I'm sober now I don't want that to happen again. Qualcuno ha una storia? Alza la, uh, la mano, sì. You're so busy, you forget a lot of Stai zitto! Stai spaventando mia figlia! Basta! You know, I'm haunted a little bit by the fact that I get these paranoid thoughts. You don't even help me with that. You're a big problem. I need you. You think uh, you know the truth? Why is someone like you upsetting the people? Why?
this film, the, the, the kind of uh, macro vision of it, you know, was that nothing sound like, nothing is to sound like a real instrument, even more so than uh, Tommaso, which had some real instrumentation. Of course, it had a piano, even though it was altered in the way that it was. But with Siberia, it was, uh, nothing was to really sound like an instrument. If it started sounding too much like an instrument, I can't really think of a, uh, of a scene in the film where it was sounding like a, you know, an, an oboe or, you know, a, uh, a choir of cellos or, or something. Your soul is outside of you and you must claim it. destroyed my life. What do you make of the black arts? So what are you looking at here? Okay, this was a scene from a lot uh, from Sport and Life, and that's Willem Dafoe. And that's the most recent film you did. That is actually the most recent film. That was a, a documentary that was shot in uh, in Berlin and uh, and premiered at the uh, Venice Film Festival about two weeks ago. Okay. Have you done other documentaries? With yeah. Uh, in the, since 2016, we uh, we did a series of four. Uh, the first being called Alive in France, which was, uh, you know, it was a band on the road film, uh, essentially, and kind of this uh, chronicling of, you know, Abel Ferrara and his, his band, which includes me and Paul Hip and PJ and Christine. And uh, it just showed us going from uh, gig to gig and interacting on this uh, tour that we did in France. It was, it was really nice. And that premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 2016 or 17. And then we did one called The Projectionist, uh, which is about this guy, Nick, who came into New York City from Cyprus and, uh, and became this really uh, amazing entrepreneur uh, of uh, art cinema and, uh, you know, and individual uh, theaters, right? At, at a time when everything's being taken over by the cineplex and the multiplex theaters. Uh, and that premiered at the New York Film Festival, uh, or maybe Tribeca, I'm forgetting which one, and was really well received there. And then after that, we did uh, Piazza Vittorio, which was, the, uh, the story of the diversification in, uh, you know, the ethnic and racial 
uh, diversification that's been going on in Rome for 20 or 30 years and a very, very interesting and, uh, and great film, also directed by Abel. And then this most recent one is called Sport and Life, uh, which is really, it's something of a, a film about making the film and it features Abel and Willem, and then the rest of us are, are you know, are performers, and uh, myself, you know, music person on the film. I'm just trying to find places that we're, that are different for us, that's gonna challenge us, that's gonna give us something that we could maybe excel at, or we could fail at. Lord, I was a big mess up. in a real that dark side only bad things happen not only but bad things happen your karma it's your karma maybe i should make films because i need to i like it i feel like it so i do it i, I either kill myself or i do it i i make films that way i express myself if my expression is alienated, so what? At least I'm expressing myself as free as possible. I understand that David Bowie admired one of your first scores. Huh. Uh, you know, we, uh, we got, someone got in touch with us at the time of his death and they sent us a, uh, a handwritten sheet from David Bowie. It was a, a photocopy, it was a Xerox of it, but nonetheless. Uh, and this person was an orchestral musician in New York who had asked him about what films he liked and what film scores he liked. And the very top film on the list was uh, Abel's, I think it was Miss 45, right? It was Miss 45 and there was Abel's name and my name next to it. So we thought that was a very, very nice, uh, just a nice honor and, and compliment. And in the same respect, when Miss 45 came out, an, an agent told Abel that, uh, that his client, Jack Nicholson, had come in and said, you gotta see this movie, uh, Ms. 45. He said, it's got this great score. It's my favorite score. So, you know, we got both Jack and, uh, and Bowie as fans. Every day, on every street, in every city, women are insulted, abused. funeral, which was, uh, I don't know, something like in 96 or something. And it was set up at a, uh, a nightclub in Harlem. And we had done, we had done playbacks for 
a couple of key scenes. There was one where Paul Hip was dancing. It was called, uh, uh, I think, Ghoulie's Dance. That was the character's name. And I did this very, very elaborate, uh, almost like a Fletcher Henderson or big band arrangement. And it was really, it was fast and great. And uh, everybody loved it and it, it worked. It worked really well, but we ended up having, this was the, the spontaneity that you're talking about. We ended up having, uh, I think four or five musicians on the set and no score to play from. We, we were ostensibly going to be uh, lip syncing, if you will, you know, play syncing, you know, fingering the, uh, the instruments uh, to the track and then the action and the dancing and whatever would be going on on the sound stage or in the set. And um, Abel at that point said, scrap the playback and play it live. Now we didn't really have, <laughs> it was a complex uh, piece of music. So I had to quickly um, adapt that and convey it to the musicians who were there really for just playback purposes. Uh, and then we rehearsed it a little bit on the set and then it was shot live on the set as the scene went from that room, the main room, to another room. Then we started hearing the pre-recorded stuff, if I, if I remember collect, correctly. And then it went to an exterior and I think we were hearing some of the pre recorded which I was happy about because that was really good too. But that was a very spontaneous thing and it worked wonderfully. Also in the same film, we did a song called uh, Tonight Will Be The Night, which uh, Chris Penn, the late great Chris Penn uh, sang. And it was very spontaneous and he could really sing. He was just a, a belter. And we, at the end of that day of shooting, and it's really, uh, hopefully we have a clip of it or people can find it uh, for sure online, uh, is Chris Penn singing that, that song. And that was very spontaneous and the whole, uh, the whole group of us and I played piano on it and Annabelle Sciorra was in the, in the scene and, and Chris was singing and I, it was just a, a rave up uh, on camera. So that was really, uh, that was cool.